We all know that immigration is key to our economic success and to the future of our communities. We have an aging population in New Brunswick, a declining population, and at the same time, we have literally thousands of jobs that go unfilled in our province each year. Immigrants can help us build the economy that we all want in this community, and what is great about Fredericton and our regional partners is that we want immigrants in this community. And Minister Hussein, you will see that by the gathering here today. This is a community willing to act and step up to the plate based on some of the programs we put in place and are in collaboration with our provincial allies as well. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge uh, as we gather here on unceded traditional Wulastukwe territory that everybody who has come to New Brunswick since our first peoples were here is an immigrant themselves. I'm so pleased to be able to work closely with my friend Ahmed Hussein. Merci beaucoup, ladies and gentlemen, our Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, Ahmed Hussein. Uh, I, I want to begin by acknowledging that this is unceded traditional territory and to thank uh, the indigenous peoples of this land who continue to inhabit this territory and for all of them to allow us uh, to enjoy of the bounty of this territory. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to start with a statistic. And I've used this before, but I, I think it's very, very illustrative. And it's very, um, it gives you a picture of where we are headed, but that where we're headed is not inevitable. We can do something about it. So in 1972 in Canada, we had seven working Canadian adults supporting each retiree. That's a healthy ratio, you'd think. But by, by 2012, that ratio had dropped to four working Canadians supporting each retiree. So we lost three people there. And uh, by 2036, which is not that long away from now, uh, it's less than 20 years away, we will only have, if we don't increase and remain ambitious in our immigration targets, we will only have two working Canadians supporting each retiree. We don't have to end up in that situation, but what we have to do is make choices now to be ambitious in immigration, to grow our economy, but also to grow our population. And if you want to know um, how the impact of that two to one ratio is like, you don't have to wait for 2036 to see it on the ground. You just have to go to Newfoundland and Labrador. There, for every 100 adults who join the workforce, to start working and paying taxes. 125 retire from the workforce. I've seen um, a company in Drummondville, Quebec, that had to pull its researchers in white coats away from the labs into the working floor, into the factory floor, to deliver on an existing contract. And they're saying, if, we, if we're not able to attract more workers, we'll simply move, because we need to grow. And if we can't get 600 to 1,000 uh, employees extra a year, we would have to go somewhere else where we can get that labor. So please help us. And so it's really uh, to this crowd more than anyone else. The employers here would understand what I'm talking about. When you are a small business that needs to grow, that needs to create more jobs for Canadians, that needs to improve its bottom line, and reinvest in the business and go further, you need people. And so that's the, the basic argument for immigration. But it's more than that. It's also about diversity. The Canada that you see today is largely a product of immigration. And immigration enables us to attract people from all corners of the world. And unlike other countries who talk about integration and say, why are these people integrating? Why are these people not integrating? Why are these people not integrating? We make it happen because we invest in integration. We understand that integration relies also on the investment of, of governments, of all orders of government, to enable newcomers to be able to have the tools that they need to succeed. Because we know that when those newcomers succeed, Canada succeeds. And there's a very interesting dynamic that happens when uh, employers Forget about just the feeling of unfilled jobs. There's also skills gaps in Canada that are simply not being met in some sectors of our economy by the local talent pool. 
it's not enough. We are producing talented individuals through our education system, but they are not enough. We have a good problem in this country of a growing economy, and uh, a growing economy that's creating a lot of jobs, and in some parts of Canada, the economy is growing at a faster rate than the national average. And in some parts of Canada, we are almost at full employment. And in some sectors, we are at, at underemployment. So in those sectors that rely on a lot of high-skilled talent, they need the domestic talent pool supply is simply not enough. So they need the immigration system, they need governments to deliver for them so that they can grow further. And uh, you know, it, it can be a big company needing hundreds if not thousands of highly skilled individuals to come and deliver on their contracts, but it can also mean uh, the difference between someone who has a vision right here in Fredericton and then turning that vision through the skills, the particular niche skills of a, of a foreign worker to turn that vision into reality and create jobs for people right here in New Brunswick. I want to talk about the Atlantic Immigration Program. This is the first employer-led immigration program in Canadian history. And it is so because it is geared towards the particular needs of Atlantic Canada, the particular demographic challenges right here in Atlantic Canada, but also the particular labor market challenges here. So the Atlantic Immigration Program incorporates all of those things that I said. No LMIA, very fast processing, permanent residency for the skilled worker and their family, and in exchange for giving a break to the employer on the LMIA, we expect the employer to help that newcomer family, that family of the highly skilled worker, to settle in Atlantic Canada so that they can have better retention outcomes. And the program is now in its third year. And if you compare the statistics from the first year in 2017 to 2018, it's night and day. The program has really taken off. And that is why a few days ago I was able to update the Atlantic Premiers on that progress. In, uh, in uh, 2017, Atlantic Canada was only able to land 82 permanent residents under the Atlantic Immigration Program. In 2018, they were able to land 1,491 uh, permanent residents and their families. 3,700 employers have now registered under the program. You know, every year that I come to Atlantic Canada to, to update on the progress of the Atlantic Immigration Program, we find new ways to tweak the program to make it even better. And this year, the key takeaway is students. That uh, within the Atlantic Immigration Program, there's a, there's a stream for international students to stay in, in Atlantic Canada once they graduate from schools here. And under the old uh, uh, system within the, within the Atlantic uh, Immigration Program, uh, they only had 12 months after graduation to get a job and then apply through the, the program. In order to help them uh, and, and increase those retention rates and keep more of those students in Atlantic Canada, I've just announced that we will allow them to now have a 24-month window as opposed to 12-month window to allow them to get that job and then apply for the, uh, for the permanent residency. The other thing that we've done because of the momentum and because of the strength of the program now, uh, the Government of Canada has decided to respond to the needs of employers and provinces here in Atlantic Canada and extend the pilot program from three years to five years. We immediately saw that for us to meet the needs of Canadians when it comes to immigration, we had to do better. We had to do better by employers, for example. Uh, they told us that it, it was getting, it was taking too long to get talent to Canada through the immigration system. And we listened and we introduced a program called the Global Skills Strategy, which enables and has cut that time down from seven months to 10 business days. Now, I know in the private sector, that's not a huge difference, but in, in government, that's revolutionary. <laughs> uh, to go from seven months uh, with the government machine that we have to 10 days to deliver uh, a visa and a work permit in 10 days, it, it, it's incredible. And it's working across the country because I, I check with employers. The, the second change that we made is to the express entry system. We're giving more points to French uh, language speakers within the, uh, within the uh, express entry pool, which should help 
increase the number of francophone immigrants outside of Quebec. And I know that this is something that New Brunswick cares deeply about. This is a program that allows any employer, any employer to bring in a highly skilled francophone worker and get a break on the labor market impact assessment. Uh, since its introduction in June 2017, Canada has attracted 15,000 of the most highly skilled people in the world. And 25% of those people are American. There was a time when we used to lose talent to the United States. Now they're coming to Canada, and it's because of our immigration system. But it's not just about attracting talent and labor. It's also about uh, being open uh, in our hearts and in our communities to refugees, because refugees also have a contribution to make. I'll tell you the story recently of a young woman I met, Sasha Bakaria, in uh, Montreal. She came to uh, Canada to seek protection as uh, a Syrian refugee of Armenian background at the age of 19. She's 21 now. She's studying her fourth language. She's studying aerospace engineering at, at Concordia University. And here's the kicker. She's made her first invention. She's invented an aircraft, a small aircraft engine part that enables those aircraft to travel uh, with a more powerful engine, but also to reduce emissions at the same time. So this is a 21-year-old refugee who's already making a difference, who's already making a contribution to our economy and to our skills uh, and to our innovation ecosystem. And she's proud of her new country, and her community is so proud of her. So let no one tell you that refugees do not make a contribution. That's false. That's hogwash. And in fact, if you look at the labor market outcomes, eventually, after a number of years of integration and settlement support, you see that refugees end up making the same contributions as all the other economic immigrants and family class immigrants. So our job is to continue down the road of reducing wait times in the immigration system, increasing, uh, the, the, increasing the, the immigration levels. As I said, we need more workers, we need more families to be reunited. And of course, we have to also share in our responsibility as a responsible global nation. I want to end by talking about something that really worries me, Matt, and our government a lot, which is that the system of immigration, although it's not perfect, and although we continue to tweak it, compared to the rest of the world, we're light years ahead. We're light years ahead. Every single election in Europe is about immigration. It's about integration. How do we do this? How do we do that? They can't figure it out. We have. We have, and the statistics demonstrates that. 93% of newcomers to Canada acquire English or French very quickly. 85% of newcomers finally take the final step of integration to become Canadian citizens. I can tell you those statistics are to die for. When other countries look at that, they say, how are you Canadians able to do this? We can't figure it out. It's because we invest in settlement and integration. So what I'm getting at is, the system that is working so well for us, that is working so well for Atlantic Canada, that really in many ways is critical to the future of New Brunswick, that very system is now under attack. It's under attack from outside, with anti-immigrant rhetoric coming in through our social media and other, other players, and it's getting traction. And there are politicians out there in Canada who are trying to divide Canadians, who are trying to use the campaign of fear and division to perpetuate anti-immigrant sentiments. So I would say to you that please fight those fear with facts. We have a national campaign called Why Immigration Matters, which combines those statistics and the numbers that I just shared with you together with personal stories, stories of newcomers who are now Canadians from coast to coast to coast who are making a contribution, who are proud to be Canadians, who are proud to give back to their country to their adopted country, to their new communities. And when you combine those statistics with those stories, it's really, it's, it's really, really powerful. So the campaign is called Why Immigration Matters. One word, Why Immigration Matters. And what I'm asking you to do, what I'm pleading with you to do, is to not take this consensus of immigration that has been in Canada for decades for, for granted. We now have to fight for this. So please include the local success stories uh, in that campaign. Highlight those stories. Highlight the fact that New Brunswick was per capita the, the largest recipient of Syrian refugees in Canada. You should be proud of that. 
and you should give yourselves a, a round of applause for it. So I think we have time for two or three questions. Change starts from the bottom up. It's a community effort, and I, I really truly believe that we can rely on our federal and provincial governments to give us the support if we if we take hold and, and, and make that change happen. So we're here to support you, and I think on behalf of my clients and, and just about everybody in the room, once again, thank you so very much. And so we will continue to work with our provincial allies, and we will encourage everyone in this room to force that continued collaboration upon us. So rather than a question, it's an issue. So the thing is, I come from Nepal, and, uh, and right now a lot of Nepalese people, a lot of Nepalese students, they are going abroad to study. And then they're going to so many different countries, they're working really hard and everything. But, but like to get a, a student visa of uh, Canada is really difficult. And the reason why I got it is I was in UK when I applied for it. And I have seen the situation of uh, international students in UK and I've heard stories of international students in, uh, in US and Australia and I feel that that compared to them I have got a lot of facilities and everything and then I feel like maybe like maybe uh, maybe maybe you guys can uh, can address this issue because they want to come to this country because they want to work hard they want to get a degree and then they want to utilize their skills yeah. so and I also know that in other various countries as well it's really difficult to get study permit I'll just comment on the last comment uh, earlier. You bet I'm going to highlight uh, New Brunswick's uh, efforts. I've already done that in my social media. I have 47,000 followers, and now they know what New Brunswick is all about and what Fredericton is doing every single day to welcome refugees, to uh, welcome talent right here in, uh, in Fredericton. On the international students, we are the first government in Canadian history, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and our team, to say to potential international students abroad, not only come and study in Canada, but we want you to stay. We're the first to say that because these are people who are young, they're keen, they've studied in our institutions, they speak English or French. Why would we not want to hang on to these people? They make amazing future citizens. So we made it easier for international students to come and it's demonstrated by our increase every single year. Uh, we're seeing a massive increase in the number of international students coming here. International students contribute $15.5 billion into our GDP. That's more money than soft road lumber. So this is a huge resource and we need, to, especially in Atlantic Canada, we need to start thinking more about international students as an export market. And the, there's no ceiling. Unlike other immigration programs, we can, we can double the number of international students. No problem. And the university students and college presidents and the, and the university presidents tell us that they can do that. There's room for more and more and more. Uh, how we can facilitate and, and help, we are trying. There's a program called the Student Direct Stream. It's an optional program, but if, if a student is able to uh, deposit some money for their future education and living expenses in Canada uh, through the SDS program, it's an expedited service and it I mean, it's not a guarantee, yes, but it, it improves your chances of getting accepted. Uh, the other thing is also more outreach by our visa officers and our trade commissioner service, as well as the visa officers abroad to, to, to engage with the uh, educational institutions, the high schools and the colleges over there, to then be able to, to have more knowledge and have more comprehensive knowledge when they assess the application. So we are trying to deal with with increasing those approval rates. But there's a lot of people with professional credentials. Engineers, architects, dietitians, I, 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 they, they all speak to me. And it's very difficult for, I hear, for many people with provincial credentials to, to crack that, uh, that barrier and, and get back into the marketplace. Now I know there's uh, professional associations and standards have to be high, I understand completely. But is there a provincial, national movement that can be done to, to, to make that a bit easier and are we also encouraging people that are coming here with those credentials about the steps that they have to take? So that's an open question. Uh, Ahmed and I have answered this I think in every single forum we have, uh, we have, we have been at over the last couple of days uh, which re-emphasizes the importance of this issue uh, but we know that this is not a new issue. This is an issue that uh, 
communities have been dealing with uh, for decades. Um, certainly credential recognition uh, falls within provincial jurisdiction uh, and there's a lot of leadership that needs to be taken by the professional associations and, uh, and those accrediting institutions. And to be fair, there's been a lot of movement uh, that has taken place in recent years with some of the professional colleges and associations um, opening their doors more to, to newcomer credentials. Given that it's provincial jurisdiction, we realize that the federal government continues to have a significant role to play in helping support um, workforce integration uh, with the experience and education and skills that newcomers have. And we've introduced a strategy, the workforce integration strategy. Yeah, the targeted employment. Targeted employment strategy. Yeah. I, I, there's all kinds of acronyms for everything. But essentially, the federal government is now providing financial remuneration, paying people to leave whatever employment they may be in and go back and receive the skills training or the, the credential upgrades they need to move into the profession. We are then giving them payment, we are paying them to get the Canadian experience they need and to write the exams needed to move into those professional fields. So where the uh, federal government has the levers to do so, we have made significant investments in doing that. Uh, Ahmed is intimately familiar with the work of that strategy, and I, I'll let him also talk about some of the pre-arrival work uh, yes. that is taking place um, to help avail people of the knowledge they need before coming to this country. Yes, so some of that uh, strategy includes m investing more money in pre-arrival services so that you know if we identify through our immigration system federally of an engineer in Ecuador through our immigration system, but we know that that engineer is going to land in New Brunswick, we are not going to wait for them to land here before we help them with the credentials recognition. We'll start the process over there by connecting them in Ecuador to the licensing body here in New Brunswick. And the federal government is actually uh, investing in those regulatory bodies, giving them the capacity to connect with those immigrants and us making the connections so that that engineer in Ecuador can start the licensing process there and use the time that they have before they get to Canada and then they can hit the ground running in New Brunswick as an engineer. It's, it's actually more, even more sophisticated than that. I've seen an automation engineer who we identified through our immigration system that was landing in Toronto and then through the pre-arrival services, we're putting $113 million more into pre-arrival services and through those services we were able to get that engineer a job three days before they landed in Canada. So that's where we're going. Uh, this strategy is even paying for their exams, paying for their books, paying for their application fees, pay, uh, connecting them with mentors, uh, job matching, because some jobs from other parts of the world uh, don't have the same titles as the jobs here, and so it's, it's, it's making those connections and, and connecting them to the right jobs and helping subsidize their wages uh, when they get licensed so that they can get their Canadian work experience. We want these people to practice, and a lot of them have actually benefited. It's, and it's not just the usual professions, it's electricians, for example. It's uh, nurses, it's everybody. So this is a, a very serious commitment by the Government of Canada. <coughs> $27.5 million just for ESDC, $113 million for pre-arrival services. Uh, but the regulatory bodies have to move, and some have, but some haven't. So you also have to pressure them, because we don't have jurisdiction over the reg regulatory bodies. The province does. So please pressure the province. But where we have jurisdiction and influence, we've removed those barriers. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup.